Good morning. Uh, we're going to start our uh, annual meeting and also our final webinar for 2022 for the Affordable Housing Professionals of New Jersey. Uh, good morning. I'm Ed Schmier. I'm the current president of the organization, and we're pleased to welcome you uh, to the webinar this morning. Uh, the first order of business uh, by our bylaws is to have an annual meeting. And uh, we're doing that virtually this year. Uh, we'll all be able to get together again next year and kind of renew acquaintances in person. Uh, we have elected to uh, do our final annual meeting this year uh, by uh, virtue of the uh, Zoom. Uh, and the first order of business for me is to report that we had an election uh, and we have re-elected uh, a number of our colleagues back to the board of directors. So I would congratulate uh, Mary, uh, Mary Beth Lonergan, uh, Frank Piazza and Marilyn Tickton, all of which have been, uh, and Brian Rappaport, I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't, I almost forgot. All of them unanimously elected to return to the board of directors. And we thank them and all the members of the board for serving. Uh, they're the people that put these programs together, and uh, and we're we're delighted that these four are coming back to join us. So that completes our annual uh, meeting uh, is to report the uh, election results. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce my colleague Mark Leckington. And uh, Mark has a few things to introduce with the Rutgers folks, and then we move on to our program. So, Mark, uh, take it away. Thanks, Ed. Good morning, everyone. Um, Mark Leckington, um, I, I'm the Vice President of AHPNJ. I've, uh, it's uh, quite an honor to, to be serving in that role and uh, continue to be working with the organization. Um, we had planned to have Lakia Nicholson on from the Center for Government Services. I do not see her in the list of panelists or attendees. Um, if she happens to pop in, uh, could someone please alert me? I'll, I'm going to mention a few things, but I think we're going to have a, a slight addition to our agenda. Um, so if, as many of you know, the AHPNJ would not be as sex successful as it is without the strong partnership that we've had with the Center for Government Services at Rutgers. Um, this is a, um, a partnership that's been going on as long as the organization has. Um, we've been fortunate to be in a position where we're working directly with them to, um, to create content, to improve content, um, and to uh, help those of us working in this world uh, reach a, you know, a certain level of, of, um, of uh, competency and, and understanding of these uh, incredibly complex rules. Um, and, and, and it's just been incredibly successful. And for most of that time, we've, we'd been working with um, just a couple of different individuals at, at the Center for Government Services. But earlier this year, uh, Lakia Nicholson, who's the senior program coordinator, took over uh, for Christy Sikio. Um, and and it's, it's been seamless. Uh, things have been going incredibly well with the transition. Uh, classes seem to be uh, more active than ever with the um, participation and and, and just uh, we've most of the a lot of the classes have had to double up on their offerings uh, for many years. There were just single uh, opportunities for a lot of these classes. And, and now we're seeing um, interest uh, growing to the point where we're requiring to have uh, additional classes. Um, I was going to introduce Lakia and have her go over the list of graduates this year. And uh, she's not here. And Lindsay very quickly pivoted like she's uh, so good at. And she just sent me the list of um, individuals that reached the required certificate, required number of credits uh, in order to be certified as a um, as an affordable housing professional in the state of New Jersey. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to run down that list, and uh, they're in no uh, they're in no order. Um, so actually, they're in alphabetical order. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Jasmine Andrews. Uh, was successfully, um, again, these are all folks that have, have reached the, the level of affordable housing professional certification. If you are here, uh, virtual high five, job well done. Um, Jasmine Andrews, Maria Burak, uh, from Caldwell, uh, Clarice Kofi was also uh, added to the list this year. Scott Crabtree, Victor Finnamore, 
uh, Nakota Grant, Diana Grindstaff, Neela Hanuman, Alexander McLe Mc McLean, um, Alex Tercy is shaded in blue, but that's probably because he got a perfect score in all of his, all of his, uh, oh, he just, yeah, so he completed the last year. Uh, that might be why he shaded in blue. Um, Brittany Garcia Sanchez, congratulations. Kathleen Appleby, Jocelyn Bello, Amanda Booth, Amanda Bregenzer, Reg forgive me, from Hopewell Township, well, almost a neighbor. Uh, Renee Campanelli, Jessica Cordoza, Evan Cornell, Angela Galante, Angela very well. Uh, Abdul Basiat Jenkins, uh, a, a neighbor of mine, lives a couple of blocks from me. Congratulations, Abdul. Uh, Stephen Can John, uh, Alicia Johnson, Ronald Kirk, Andrea Lamano, Janine Malou, Amanda O'Lear, Alexandra, Alexandra Papadopoulos, Rashira Pringle, William Robbins, Diana Tarabat. Chia, yeah, Diana Tarabuchia, Edward Williams, Gerald Zucker, and Jeffrey Shoemaker. Congratulations. Job well done. Uh, with that, um, I am going to, um, oh, I, I just want to say very quickly, one more time, th this partnership with Rutgers, we would not be as successful as we are as an organization if it weren't for this partnership. We place a lot of value on the working relationship with them. We are incredibly happy with, with the state of those, those communications and the partnership. It just seems to be growing every year. Um, and you know, huge thank you to all the decision makers at Rutgers and everybody in leadership there that have recognized the importance of this and have, have gotten behind it and, and supported us. So um, huge debt of gratitude there. Uh, and at this point, I am going to turn it over to uh, Samantha Hennessy, and I think we are officially beginning the the um, content portion of our presentation, our webinar today. Thank Samantha. you, Mark. Uh, that's a lot of graduates this year. That's very impressive. Um, so yes, we. I would like to introduce uh, Jane Luciano. Uh, she will be presenting Thriving in Affordable Housing in Stressful Times. Um, I was going to give an introduction of Jane, but talking to her briefly on the phone, uh, listening to her do her introduction, I thought that it would be better for her to give her own introduction. So I will turn it over to Jane, but in the meantime, uh, I will do the slides for her. And I am Samantha Hennessy with the Alpert Group. I am an, a developer of affordable housing. Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, good morning, everybody. I am very excited to be with you. First, let me just tell you uh, how I got here. Um, I have a friend who um, is in uh, my own town and does affordable housing. Um, she was a very good friend of my husband's and she has, you know, just uh, been a wonderful friend to me. And I admire what she does in affordable housing. I've met people who she's put in housing, uh, young couples and 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 older people who went through the process and and achieved um, owning their own homes and i will tell you they have incredible joy when they describe you know being in their own home being a homeowner uh being able to do that and and it all comes back to people like yourselves who help people through that process and whether you're on the front end of like samantha of developing affordable housing or you're on um, uh, you're, uh, an affordable housing um, person, meaning you are a provider of affordable housing or you're somebody like my friend Gail who is helping people into affordable housing. You're part of a system uh, that I admire. And so I said to Gail when she was describing what you guys go through, I go, you know what? I'd like to help you guys. I'd like to do something for you guys. And um, we, through this wonderful group on the phone, have developed a program that I hope will help you today. So a little bit about me, my background, I'm a Rutgers alum. So go Mark for giving Rutgers uh, RU a little bit of, of pump today. I love that. Um, I undergrad and graduate school. Um, I have a master's in uh, human resources and industrial relations. I um, 
was a corporate executive in human resources, ended my career. I, I was at Mobile Oil and Citibank and ended my career at Bristol Myers Squibb, spent 17 years at Bristol Myers Squibb as their head of internal consulting, uh, Lean Sigma and uh, learning globally for the company. And um, if you don't think that's a stressful job, that's a really stressful job. You're working at the very top of the house. and. Um, I will tell you a few of those stress stories as we kind of go through this. Ended my career as the, uh, uh, you know, there in 2014 with the elimination of my job. So also a stressful moment in my life, but I didn't really know that God was really preparing me for more. Uh, in 2014, I started a business. It's been, you know, very successful. I work in mostly corporate um, um, companies, mostly Fortune 500 companies. Um, and uh, I do all kinds of things. I do strategy, I do strategy execution, I help them with their HR programs, I help them uh, do diagnostics to understand what's not going well in their companies, and I come in and help shine a light and bring leadership teams to one truth where they can make a plan to move forward. So that's what I do for a living. I have three sons in uh, 2018, um, from 20. 15 to 2018, I um, was glad to be on my own. I could make my own hours and God, I needed that because my husband was in the battle of his life um, uh, with cancer, with colorectal cancer and um, died um, all too young um, in 2018. And then I had these three wonderful boys to raise, which uh, in, in the best of times, parenting is a stressful endeavor, but um, you know, when you're looking at that kind of loss in someone's life, it's really uh, tough, but I'm proud to say I have three great kids. Um, I have been lucky to be uh, very, very successful both in my career and in my um, um, home life. Um, and I know that's hard, you know, odd to say when, you know, you become a widow very young, but I was lucky. I was lucky to have my husband. I was lucky to, I'm lucky to have my family and I'm lucky to have a roof over my head. And, and um, so that's really me in a nutshell. I'm happy to be with you here today. Um, if you could move to the, the, the second slide, that would be great, Samantha. So while we're waiting for Samantha, um, it's coming. Um, go to the second one and um, there we go. So, you know, the goal is to get applicants into affordable housing and having experienced um, listening to people who have been successful in this process, boy, that's great joy. But when I ask people, like, you know, I've talked to people on the phone and I say, well, how often does that happen? Is that like an everyday occurrence? At the end of the day, you get to drop some keys in somebody's hand and you get to say, wow, congratulations, you now are, you know, the owner of this house. Um, and they say no to me. And so I got a little of the statistics and I think it's less than one person a month. What contributes to that, right? The applicant waiting list is really long and you could go to the next one. Uh, the applicant waiting list is extremely long. There is a high level, there's a high need and that need is higher than the inventory. We all know that the housing market has been like crazy in the last couple of months. And, and also because the renting market is crazy, people are just not moving. They're not, they're afraid to give up, you know, renting to own or owning to rent because it's, or, or even give up their home to buy another one because the market is so um, volatile right now. Um, the process is cumbersome and it takes a long time. So again, I asked about how long and, you know, the best I heard was six months. The worst I heard was years. So on that waiting list. And so it's long, it's cumbersome uh, and you can't help everybody. So lots of people have needs, but there's just not an ability to help everybody who comes to the table. Um, so there's much work and time to get every win. And that is your current reality. Um, and that's a tough reality to live in. Um, and you have to figure out how do I live for the joy of handing somebody those keys and yet put up with the, um, the journey because the journey sometimes is very rough. So go to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit more about that context, right? So is the pace fast? No, the pace is slow and arduous, right? It's not like you fill out a piece of paper tomorrow and I hand you, uh, today and I hand you the keys tomorrow. It's a long process and there's multiple steps. There's many steps. Sometimes you have to go too 
forward and then three back. Um, and sometimes, you know, people who are getting into this, it's their first time. And so they don't fill out the paperwork right. They don't understand that there's a lot of supporting documentation that they need. And so it's tough, it's emotional, and it's stress provoking. And there's, sounds like there's many actors in your system, right? There's clients, there's municipality, there's affordable housing agents, there's providers, there's planners, there's, you know, funders, right? So it's, a, it's, it's um, a crowded field of people trying to make these things um, happen. And so there's a lot of behaviors happening in this, right? There's a lot of behaviors required in this. And this is what we're gonna talk about today, collaboration, resilience, both of you. And by the way, most of these behaviors, when I'm talking to you guys, I'm talking to you guys as people in the system. So it means whether you're, you know, um, an affordable housing agent or a provider or a planner or in a municipality, or you're a client, you have to use these behaviors, collaboration, resilience, you have to have a lot of resilience, managing resistance, managing emotion, managing conflict. Those are all things that you have to be good at to do this job in a way that you can leave it and still have your sanity and feel the joy on a, you know, with some regularity of helping people. So if the joy isn't every month and a half, I get to hand somebody the keys, what is the joy? What can I control? What can I do differently moving forward to make sure that every day I show up my best self to every client I see. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So you can move to that next slide and we'll talk about those skills. So we're gonna talk about understanding and managing change. And why are we talking about that? Well, for those clients, this is a major life change. And so you really have to understand what they're going through and what you can do to help them through those change hurdles, right? We're gonna talk about collaboration. Uh, this is not a straight road, right? There are lots of actors. And so collaboration is necessary for the system to come together to support an applicant and put them into um, affordable housing. Um, we're gonna talk about empathetic listening, not just listening. Listening is important and most people don't do it. If you are thinking in your head while the other person is talking, guess what? You're not listening because as much as we'd like to say we're multitaskers, our brains can't do that. So listening is the first hurdle. Empathetic listening is the second hurdle, right? And then we're gonna talk about managing conflict. So what do I do when somebody is in my face about something or blaming me for something that really is about their accountability of doing something? And finally, and for me, most importantly, you know, you can't go through life without a lot of self-care and some mindfulness. And we're gonna go through some of those um, skills and we're gonna do a couple of practices as part of that, okay? Um, I know that we're gonna get interrupted. So Lindsay, before I start change, this might be a good time to do that first question. So everybody has to vote uh, for one of these uh, choices. What are you here for? Why are you here? And that'll help me to know where I spend my time today. Lindsay, will we see results from this? Yes, I can show you the results at the end. That'd be great. Let me know when we are going to show results and we'll go from there. Okay. So uh, looks like all of the above is what people want. Great. So hopefully, um, you know, I will um, be able to do that. Uh, you know, number one was all of the above. Number two was techniques to reduce my stress. And we are going to spend a lot of time there. Okay. So let's keep going then. And um, there will be a point, Samantha, where I pause before we go to the next topic and we'll see if anybody has any questions. Okay unless you wanna to wait till the very end. 
but I like to kind of go as we go. That works. Okay. All right. So let's talk about the elephant and the rider. I love this analogy. I think you won't forget it. <laughs> but uh, imagine that the rider, that little person sitting on top, is your logic and the elephant is emotion. Uh, you need both to go through change. And so clients and yourselves, as you're moving through change, something something changes, a process changes, or um, something bigger. I have to fill out some paperwork and they're, you know, the affordable housing person is telling me that I didn't do it correctly, right? So there's logic, I hear what you're saying, and there's emotion that happens to people. So both are needed. Uh, question, uh, rhetorical question here, who do you think wins in a battle between the rider and the elephant? So if the elephant is emotion and it's upset, who's gonna win that? Is it the, the you know, 3000 ton you know, elephant or is it the 150 pound man sitting on top, right? It's the elephant, right? So we know that as part of change, we have to remember that while we can be very logical as managers and, um, and as the person who's helping up someone else through the change, that we have our own emotions to manage and we have the emotions of the people we're working with to manage, okay? So go to the next one. So change is ahead for all of us. The truth is that everything is changing all of the time. And so we come into our day probably having experienced multiple changes. Our roads close, somebody cuts us off. Uh, you know, um, our refrigerator, you opened a refrigerator and it was warm. Like it could be a big disaster or it could be a little thing, a ro uh, you know, a road detour. Um, or, so, you know, you always park in the same place and you get there and someone's parked in your parking space. All of those are changes that we have to deal with as we process through, and that's before we've even come to work. Um, so what is change? Change is hard at first, it really is, it's hard. We go through emotions, and then once we get past the emotions and we get to the logic, um, you know, it, it just is hard to do. Um, I'd like everybody who is wearing a watch or a, um, or a bracelet to move it to their other arm. Just take it off and put it on your other arm. And then you'll understand what I say when I tell you it feels weird, uncomfortable, uh, and, and even may induce some stress if you leave it there for the next hour. You know, I do this exercise when I teach about change and I make everybody in the room look at each other and then turn their backs and change three things about their physical appearance. And I asked them to agree up front that they will not go back to their changes. I cannot tell you. The person who took the shoe off, as soon as they, the other person, they're putting their shoe back on or they're moving their watch back or what have you. And that's minor changes to your physical appearance. So change is hard at first. And it's really messy in the middle. <laughs> it's true. But it is gorgeous at the end. And so if the change I'm trying to make is to, as an applicant, to move through this hard at first, messy in the middle thing, and only gorgeous at the very end when you hand me your the keys, right? Um, obviously, metaphorically, the keys, right? You're not the person handing the keys, but you're basically handing them the keys. Um, understanding that there's a lot of messiness and hardness as people progress through that. And that's the same thing for all of you who are part of that system. And whether it be the person looking for funding, right? to build some more affordable housing, or it be the person who is um, uh, the provider of affordable housing, who is dealing with uh, first time tenants who really don't know how to take care, or there's lots of complaints or what have you, or it's the person who's handling the client directly. Um, even for you, that change is hard at first, messy in the middle and gorgeous at the end. And so it's just to remember that is just a universal truth about change. So how do we manage that? How do we move from there? Um, well, let's talk about what humans typically do. Go to the next slide. Okay, so what humans typically do is they resist. Isn't that lovely, <laughs> you know? And so what's resistance? Resistance is our emotional response that occurs when our expectations are interrupted, right? So if I, if you don't give me a realistic preview up front as the client to say, hey, listen, this could take 
six months, it could take a year, you might never get affordable housing, but it is worth the journey to try, right? Unless you give me some realistic preview, I'm probably gonna have my expectations interrupted at some time. If you give me a realistic preview and say, by the way, there are many steps, lots of paperwork, lots of things you'll have to research and do, and it's going to be hard, it's gonna be messy. Um, you know, I'm probably going to have some emotional responses to that, and I'm probably gonna have some expectations that are interrupted. And the reason it occurs is because you're moving from whatever your current state is to a future state, and in between, there's this very, even in positive change, there's this very uncomfortable, ex personally expensive transition space in between. And, and again, I'm talking to all the actors in the system. You all have that, right? Um, I'll tell you two quick uh, illustrations of this. One, I don't know if anybody is as old as me, they know that every time you have to get a new phone, you dread it, right? You dread those couple of days. Uh, I remember when my kids are like, mom, you have a seven, you need to go to the 11. And I'm like, but it doesn't have a button. It's gonna take you one day to get used to not having a button. I'm like, yeah, but I like know what to do with everything right now. I can be really efficient on it, right? So that's an example of that uncomfortable, personally expensive transition uh, state that you have to go through as human beings. Um, another one, I'll use a really positive one, getting married. I can remember getting married and being so excited. <laughs> remember the first three months of marriage were very bumpy. Uh, a, I didn't realize that because I was married, I was actually have to, gonna have to tell my husband when I wasn't coming home because I was going to happy hour. I didn't know. I didn't know that he needed to know that. You know, uh, I, I didn't know that um, my house that I lived in would be messier because he wasn't as neat as me. I didn't know that, right? So there's even in very, very happy changes, um, having a child, uh, lots of sleepless nights in the first year, right? So there are things that happen even in happy change that illustrate this transition state. And you guys are producing happy changes for people, right? We talked about that joy of having somebody move into affordable housing at the end of the journey and what joy that is. But we have to acknowledge that from their current state to that happy space, there is a, a very long, uncomfortable, expensive transition state. So what do you do about this? Let's move to the next slide. And I find this really very, very helpful. So when we think about the people we're dealing with, no matter where they are in the system, um, one thing that occurs to me is people always think people are not willing. That's the first place they start. This person is not willing to cooperate, right? But the truth is, this is what we know from the research, that this is, an, this is a triangle and not willing is the smallest part of the tip. Where people start is not knowing, right? And we think, oh, I told them that. And you go, okay, well, people need to hear the same thing seven times to really truly understand it. And the first two, they're only in awareness. They don't really understand why or how they have to do that, right? So not knowing is the most important part of this. And so communications is your lens, whether, it, and remember, everybody learns differently, right? Some people learn from visuals, some people learn from words, some people learn written, some people learn from being explained to, right? So you have to acknowledge that all people don't learn the same way. And so communications needs to be delivered in multiple ways to help people. The next part of the triangle before we get to, oh, that's just an unwilling person, is not able. So I helped my brother um, last year get into his first house. He was 55. He never owned a home before. So he knew nothing about mortgages. He knew nothing about the paperwork. He knew nothing about how to pull his, even things like the supporting documents, like how do I get to my paychecks, right? How do, I didn't save all those paychecks. So how do I you know, do all the supporting things. And so I helped him through that. There was a lot of not knowing, right? And there was an awful lot of not able. He just didn't know how to do those things. And he's a very smart man. He just hadn't been through that experience before. Um, so what do we do there? We train them, we support them, we coach them. Those are our roles in our, our jobs. And then finally, there are people who are unwilling. 
and there are, but they're small, they're a small population. They're just these people that don't understand the ramification of not doing. And so they go, no, I'm done. I've given you everything I could possibly give you. It's on you now, you gotta figure it out, right? So how do you help people like that? You have to reframe for them. You have to explain it to them in another way. There have to be positive and negative sanctions. You have to negotiate with them. You have to persuade them and you have to confront them, right? So all of those things have to happen to move those unwilling people. And still, sometimes, you can't change everybody. Everybody can't make it through the process. And so that's a difficult thing to accept that change and resistance is a natural thing, but there are ways for you all to combat that, right? And it starts with the bottom. It starts with the bottom of the triangle. By the way, we will be sharing all of these slides with you all at the end. Um, if you go to the next one, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, so what do people need to help them overcome resistance. So if you have someone who's resistance, what do they need? Okay, they need three things. They need a vision. They need to know where are we going? What's, what's Nirvana look like? Where am I gonna be when this is all done? I'm gonna be in a home or I'm going to um, uh, have achieved more money to build more affordable housing to feed the system or I'm going to have done what I need to do in the municipalities to make sure that all of the paperwork gets done to approve new affordable housing, right? So those are all the things that I need to be able to say are part of that vision, whoever the player is right here. So what's the vision? Where am I going? Second thing I need is to be dissatisfied with the current state, right? If people are not, if people are like, eh, I'm okay, I have a client right now, they wanna be number one in the in their industry right now, they're number two. If all the employees say, you know what, I got a job, I'm happy being number two. Do you think they can get to number one? No, right? So everybody has to be become dissatisfied with the current state or else they don't move. It's not worth it for them to go through that ugly middle part, right? And the third thing they need is the first steps. And they need the first steps every time they're moving to another level of work, right? So they need the first steps and then they need the next first steps and the next first steps. And if you achieve all of those, you will overcome resistance, okay? So I wanna just tell you a story, a quick story about this picture. Um, does it, anybody know what this picture is? Hopefully a couple people recognize it. It's a very famous artist. Okay, it's Monet. Okay, and anybody who knows Monet knows he was very famous for, um, um, he did pictures of people, but the thing that I would say as an impressionist he was most famous for was wildflowers and his water lilies. So imagine my um, delight when I went to Paris and my friend said, you know what, I'm gonna take you to see Mon uh, Monet's home. It's in uh, Givernay and we're gonna take a picnic, we're gonna stop it and buy a a picnic lunch, and then we're gonna go out there and we're gonna have a picnic. So we get there and I am astounded. It is magnificent. You feel like you walked into his wildflowers painting. In front of his little chalet is a field of wildflowers. Now I was there in April, so it was immensely beautiful. It smelled great. There were little bees buzzing. The weather was perfect. So I said to my friend, hey, why don't we put our, our blanket down here and have a picnic? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. He goes, there, you haven't seen the backyard yet. And I'm like, well, this is beautiful and there's grass. We could sit here, we could have a beautiful picnic. I don't need to see the backyard, right? So he goes, no, you don't understand. The backyard is even more beautiful. You walk into his water lilies. And I said, hmm, sounds intriguing but this is really beautiful, I'm happy enough here. He goes, I'm telling you, more beautiful, more um, um, astounding, and you will feel like you literally walked into the painting. So I go, okay, how do we get there? Honest to God, true story. See that dark drippy tunnel over there? We gotta just go through that dark drippy tunnel. And there were puddles and I had flip flops on. I'm like, uh, no, let's just do the picnic here. He's like, no, 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 no. I know it's a short tunnel, there is some water. I'll tell you what, I will give you, you put the backpack with the lunch on your back, I will piggyback you through the water. So now what has he done? He's painted this incredible vision. 
He's told me it's more beautiful. So he started to dissatisfy me with the current state. And he's told me the first steps we're going to need to get there. So we go through the dark drippy tunnel. You come out into the water lilies and you come out on this little bridge. I actually wept. So I hope if any of you are ever in France and you have an opportunity to go there, it is probably the most beautiful place I've ever been in the world. And um, I promise you, you will think of this story and it'll come back to you. And that's what it takes to make resistance go away. So next slide. Okay, so now how do you actually help people? Well, we've just talked about it, right? First thing you do is you help by visioning. You help them understand where they're going and then you engage them. We know that people move through change when they're engaged. If it feels like you're doing it to them or you're telling them every step or what have you, it, they, they, they don't wanna move. So you have to engage them. And then you have to coach them, right? You have to support them in that journey. You have to coach those first steps. You have to help them understand the rationale. Why do I have to do that differently? And then you have to praise them. You have to recognize when they're doing things right, when they're moving along the process. And finally, if you don't demonstrate and role model the behavior and lead the way, so if you, are, if you meet their frustration with frustration, if you meet their stress with stress, you are not role modeling. You are not demonstrating for them how to behave in that middle period. And I know that's probably very hard at times. There are, there are, um, clients who you probably want to throw out, toss out of your office, but it's your job to demonstrate and to lead the way. Um, it's your job to recognize their baby steps along the way to help them, you know, to praise them. It's your job to coach them. And that might mean telling them for the fifth time. It might mean calling them in and helping them fill out the application. It might mean showing them on a computer how they find the supporting documents. All of that is part of the role you'll play in helping to manage people's uh, journey. So Samantha, I'm gonna pause there and just see if there are any questions So, um, from the audience about change and then we're gonna move on. Questions or comments? We do have a hand up in the chat. Uh, Suzanne, if you wanna ask, unmute yourself and ask your question. <clears throat> Suzanne? Randy Gottesman's got a question. Um, Randy, if you wanna go and we'll see if Suzanne uh, maybe had her hand up by mistake. <laughs> I had mine up by mistake as well, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. All righty. So given there's no questions, why don't we keep moving then uh, to the next slide? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about collaboration. So collaboration is working well with other people. And I know that in systems where there's a lot of people involved in making something happen, you have to work well with people. Um, and really at the heart of collaboration is caring enough about the other person to hear their perspective and to find win-win solutions, right? If all I wanna do is get my way, right, is compete with people and win, then we don't really help people and we're not really collaborating. So win-win solutions to meet their goals as well as your goals is what makes collaboration happen. Uh, people who are strong in this, they take responsibility for their work. They finish their work. They cooperate and help others get their job, the job done. They think about the greater good, not just themselves. So within the system, there, I'm sure you all have the same goal. You may touch that goal in a very different way in your roles, but the greater good is really serving people uh, who need affordable housing. And you treat everyone with respect. Collaborators are very, very good at treating people with respect. And you focus on solving problems, not placing blame. You focus on the, the uh, behavior, not the person, right? Um, so you can go to the second one. Uh, good co collaborators are reliable. Um, 
So what do other people think of your collaboration skills? They're going to judge you on your reliability. You show up, you're there when I need you, you answer your emails, um, they cooperate. And cooperation is not just collaborating, cooperating is finding a way for us to achieve that win-win. They communicate gr uh, greatly and often. They're flexible. Um, they meet their commitments and they're committed to this cause, right? Respect, they give respect and get respect. They're problem solvers and they're trustworthy. People will not open up. And this is a process where I believe you're asking people to expose their financials, their family situations, et cetera. And so if you're not trustworthy, they're not going to open up and you're not going to help them meet their goals. Next slide. So this is what you have to do. Build trust among the person you work with and applicants, right? And trust is an outcome. I can't tell you to trust me. It's about the relationship I built with you. They are able to manage and resolve conflict in a very healthy and productive way, right? They hold each other accountable for behaviors and actions that are required. And they demonstrate their commitment by following through on their, on their actions and their promises. And they focus on this shared result, right? So, you know, as a person in the system, you're not moving into that affordable housing, but that's why you're there. That's the goal is to move people into affordable housing, to make enough affordable housing to meet the need. And especially in New Jersey, I think that need is just growing and growing. And so your wait lists are getting longer while your, um, your uh, amount of affordable housing is not necessarily growing at the same rate, rate that your wait list is growing. So it's a, it's a tough thing and, it's, and it has to be shared results. So, you know, if you're a provider, if you're working directly with clients, you can't do anything unless somebody is also building new affordable housing, right? Um, so there are things that have to be done in order for you to be able to, um, um, achieve the goal. It's not a goal that any one person can, can achieve. And so it's a group goal and group goals, goals require this collaboration. Um, so you can move to the next one. Okay, they, they also require listening. So I said to you before, um, and this is a great test. Uh, uh, do it at home tonight. Somebody's talking to you. When they're talking to you, are you thinking about the next thing you're going to say or what you're making for dinner? Or are you actually listening to them, right? And are you listening for um, everything, the message, the words, but also the body language and the cues on emotions, et cetera? Um, good listeners do all of those things. And so there are three steps to help improve your listening. They are paying attention. You cannot be watching TV and listening to somebody, right? Listen intently to what's being said. Watch the body language, the cues to emotion. Those are all important and they're all delivering you a message, right? So the message isn't just the words. As a matter of fact, we know that tough conversations, they're best had in person. And why? Because words are only 30% of the message. Body language and emotion are the other, make up the other 70%. So if that's all done on the phone or, you know, um, through email or through text, how many times in your life when we first started this whole texting thing, did things get out haywire because you were, you meant one thing and the person read it another way, or they read a tone in your words, or you made a mistake and you left your cap lock on and they thought you were yelling at them right? So it's really important to pay attention to those things. Second thing is avoid interrupting. Uh, nothing takes the emotion up more than interrupting someone, right? So it may be that they're on a, you know, little bit of a tirade, but just let them get it out and then test your understanding and show your interest by paraphrasing, by asking, clarifying questions. If you don't understand the best question to ask is, or the best thing to say is, say more, right? I don't quite, I'm not quite there with you yet. Can you say a little bit more about that? And be specific. You don't want them to repeat what they said. You know, if I got most of it and I didn't understand one section, I might say, say more about this, 
um, because I'm seeking to understand. And, you know, at the end of the day, people don't want always want their way. They just always want to be heard. That's a universal truth. People just want to be heard. And so listening is really critical and making sure that you are a good listener is also really um, critical. Next slide. So guys, if you have questions, uh, as opposed to me stopping, uh, if you could put it in the, if you can put it in the um, uh, queue, um, Samantha can stop me and say, hey, there's a couple of questions. Okay. So Would this you like concept... to share another one of your poll questions now? Oh, great. That'd be great. So ask the next poll. Okay, so moderate levels of stress, but there's still, you know, over 30% of you who are either very stressed or extremely stressed. So if you're in the bottom two categories, you're really lucky because it sounds like the majority of the people working in the system are at least moderately stressed, if not even more than that. So we're gonna talk about that in a moment. Thank you for running that. So this is a concept I want to talk through, and I don't have time to show you the video, but I am going to suggest that you go on uh, YouTube and you watch this video. This, this is called Five Chairs, and um, the woman who wrote the book on uh, Five Chairs, her name is Louise, and, her, and she, you will find her TED Talk, um, and it's about 19 minutes long but it's worth watching. I have watched it change people's lives. So it's very interesting because I think as a uh, person receiving communications, um, we make a quick decision in our head as to which of these chairs we are going to sit in. I will tell you, lots of people, everybody sits in the attack chair at some point. <laughs> Um, everybody sits in the self-doubt chair at some point. Um, so let me just explain to you. The attack chair is somebody says that something to you and you are ready to attack. There's a great story that Louise tells about taking her um, significant other's daughter for the first time she takes her to a concert. And the um, young lady is a millennial. And so during the concert, I mean, it was a big deal, but she is on her phone the entire time. And in Louise's head, she's sitting in that attack chair. And she's like, what is, first of all, she's sitting in the yellow chair and she goes, what is going on? I really misjudged the situation. I can't believe she's not enjoying this. I took her to Paris. I spent a lot of money on these tickets and she's on her phone. Look, she's on her phone. So this is all going on in her head, right? And I did the wrong thing. Then she moves to the red chair and she's like, you know what, I'm gonna say something. I'm gonna say something to her. But something catches her and all of a sudden the young girl talks and she says, Louise, look, I've looked them up. She took them to her to see Manhattan Transfer. These guys are huge and famous. And by the way, I'm so excited to be here. I already uh, posted a selfie with this quote underneath. And what did it say? It said, Louise and I watching Manhattan transfer in Paris, perfect. Now imagine if she had responded from the red chair, what she would have done to that very fragile new relationship, right? And so it's important to know that to recognize where you are and to pause. And the best place to pause is in the weight chair, right? Get yourself to that green chair 
ask more clarifying questions. Remember you're listening with empathy. Um, and if you start asking questions, guess what? You move to the blue chair, the detect chair. And finally, if you've asked enough questions, you try to move to that purple chair, the connect chair, right? Um, this is probably not going to make a ton of sense to you, but it was so important and life changing. It will change the way you have conversations with your kids, your spouse, the people in your life, and your clients and your coworkers. So I encourage you to watch this, and I will um, I will send Samantha the link to this video, and she'll put it out with um, with the slides. Okay. So let's move to the next one. Okay, so we're going to start talking about conflict. Okay, when um, when you want something to happen or change, there needs to be the right level of tension. If there's too little tension, nothing happens, right? So you probably have had clients who you've asked for things and like a month goes by and you still haven't gotten them, and you're like, and uh, you know, and you're thinking to yourself gee, what, what's happening? Why aren't they? Well, there's probably not enough tension. They don't understand that they're really just holding themselves up um, in the process. And so in that case, you need to turn the tension up. You need to turn the dial a little bit on the tension and help people move up the constructive tension. Likewise, if it's too much, if the person walks into your office and they're yelling or they're you know, visibly emotional or angry, you've got to figure out a way to turn the tension down because nothing can be solved when emotions are at this level, right? Before you can even talk about the problem on the table, you have to kind of cycle through that. And, you know, there are ways to do that, right? I might say to somebody, um, I can see you're very upset. Why don't you sit down? Tell me what's going on. And you're, you know, you have to talk with a very even tone, you cannot meet them in that high tension place. Too much, too soon, tension goes up and you cannot work with the person. And so there is a constructive level of tension that has to happen in order for change to occur. And if it's too small, got to turn up the dial. And if it's too high, you got to turn down the pressure cooker, right? So both of those things are true and you have to try to get it at the right level where the person is calm, but, but also urgent enough to act. Uh, was there a question? Lindsay, did you have a question? No, I was just figuring out how to make the raise hand thing go away for people. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, maybe it's a good time before we move to the next slide to answer question number three. If you wanna pull that up. So during the past two weeks, how often have you lost patience with a coworker or an applicant? I don't, doesn't mean you acted on it. It means you lost patience. Occasionally, but some people, we've got 19% of people who either often or extremely often. God bless you, nevers. <laughs> God bless the 17% nevers. So how, you know, like what happens? Can you, can you avoid it? Can you ignore it? Move to the next slide. So there's a cost in ignoring conflict. First of all, it's not something to be ignored. Um, First of all, not all conflict is bad, right? You want enough constructive tension. And quite frankly, sometimes conflict brings things to a head that are just not happening. So it's not always bad. It is dangerous when you leave conflict for a long period of time. Let's say you know you have a coworker that you don't get along with. Um, 
if you leave that for too long, guess what? When you need them, it's festering, it's festering, it's festering. And now you enter that conversation thinking you're asking a, a very normal thing and you are the straw on that person's, on that camel's back. And all of a sudden you have very, very high tension and emotion, right? And normally we don't even have time for that, right? So don't let these things fester. If you've got conflict with somebody, solve it on a low conflict day, not on a high conflict day, because it will explode. Um, also, uh, if it's on a team of people, it fractures team. People begin to take sides. And then all of a sudden, not it's not just between two people, it's, it's affecting the performance of the overall team. Uh, conflict fosters competition, distrust, poor communications, and it affects productivity. So if we really truly have that shared goal of getting people into affordable act, uh, uh, housing, we need to be able to manage the conflict. It's a necessary part of doing our business. And it can be helpful in making necessary changes within a work environment. So if, if a conflict is because a process is cumbersome, well, you know, you, can put that conflict on the table and maybe get to a win-win solution that makes the process less cumbersome and makes the experience for the clients better. Okay, uh, move to the next one. So we have styles, we have conflict styles. Neither style is better than the other. Um, some of us are avoiders. We tend to shy away from conflict. We value harmony and positive relationships. We don't wanna hurt anybody's feelings. We don't wanna direct disrupt the team dynamic. And we often placate people or even change the topic. Those are avoiders. If you hear yourself in there, you're likely an avoider. <laughs> um, seekers are people who seem eager to engage in disagreement. They don't shy away from it. They care about the direction um, and about directness and honesty more than they care sometimes about leaving it on the table and not dealing with it. They tend to lose their patience when others aren't being equally direct. So if people are beating around the bush, you know, you've, have you ever said to somebody, um, come on, just put it on the table. You're beating around the bush. I just need to hear it right between the eyes. Give it to me. Right. Um, and they don't mind ruffling feathers. So if you were, I, 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 I would um, love to have a sense for yourself of, am I a, an avoider or am I a seeker? And I'll tell you my story. I am definitely a seeker at work. That is the job that I have. If I don't uncover things and deal with the conflict and help other people to deal with the conflict, as an organizational development person, I'm not doing my job. So I'm a seeker at work. Um, I tended to be an avoider at home. I valued harmony in my home. I had a stressful day. I wanted harmony in my home. But it, it meant that sometimes I, I didn't want to hurt anybody's feeling. I didn't want to interrupt the family dynamic, et cetera. But the truth is that I learned, you know, shortly into my marriage or into having kids that you have to put that conflict on the table. So I actively worked to be, I was having so much success as a secret work. I started kind of putting it in a little bit at home and it did help. But any of these, it's just your propensity. It is not, being an avoider is not worse than being a seeker. Sometimes seekers can be obnoxious, right? You know, um, so which are you? Let's say. Okay, so not surprising, 50-50, right, uh, approximately. Um, a few more seekers and avoiders, and probably most of you, like me, may do something different at home than you do, you know, in the office, because sometimes we kind of move around and blend those styles. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Move to the next one. So how do you, you can work with other styles. How do you do that? One is to know your own style. So how do I typically react in conflict? 
Do I run in the other direction or I run towards the conflict, right? So know yourself, know your own style, right? And then secondly, you're, if the conflict is with a particular person, begin to assess the other person's um, ability, right? Or, conflict, or, or their style, right? How do I do that? Um, if I've got to take somebody on that I haven't worked with before, I might talk to two or three, um, two or three trusted coworkers and might say, "Hey, I'm dealing with uh, Al for the first time. What do you know about Al and how he deals with conflict? You know, etc." So I might ask some questions. Um, I might know, so I might just think back to prior communications with that person, prior conflicts, how did they behave? Did they shy away from it? Did they walk into it? Or were they assertive about it? Like what was their style? Watch for patterns, get input from others. And then if none of that fails, I might go in and say, hey, I've never had a conflict with you before. Do you tend to walk into these or do you tend to avoid these, right? I might ask a direct question. Move to the next slide. So you'll get this slide, but this slide is a way to think about um, how I would approach somebody <clears throat> depending upon what I am. So if I am an avoider and I'm talking to an avoider, this is what I might do. Uh, one of you needs to take the lead. So if it's conflict that I really care about, I might take the lead and I might say directly, hey, I know neither of us like conflict, but instead of ignoring the problem, what can we do about it? Right, so I'm going to say something very gentle, but I'm going to put it on the table because I know it's 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 beginning to affect either the performance or the relationship, and I don't want either of those two things to happen. Do your best to draw the other person out, right, uh, in a sensitive and thoughtful way. I use things like, here's my point of view, um, here's why I think that. Do you see it differently? please tell me if you see that differently. So I invite people to, to not see it the way I see it. I might invite them to go first and say, let me hear your perspective about what this conflict is and then I'll give you mine. Um, if things get tough, don't shy away from it, stay in it. <laughs> You'll need to fight your natural urge to run, right? So try to stay with it, try to, to migrate a little bit to seeker. Um, each of these is a valid place you could be. If you're a seeker and you're talking to an avoider, what can you do, right? Um, invite the person to participate actively in the conversation, not to hide their opinions. Look, I really want to hear, I want this to get better. I really want to hear what you think. I don't have a pre predisposition to how we end. I want this to be a win-win. Those are the kinds of things you want to say. Don't be a bully. Uh, if you feel yourself becoming a bully, pause and say, ooh, that maybe came out a little stronger than I wanted to. So just ask the questions, be patient with the pace of the conversation. You might want to solve this in two seconds. It may take longer, especially if you're with an avoider. And then watch your tone and the volume of your voice. Avoiders will take those as signs of aggression. So there are four different scenarios. We will send this to you. It should help you to prepare for conversations. Let me just say that word again, prepare, <laughs> right? So if you're having a tough conversation, prepare, sit down, think about the other person, think about what they might want. Make some notes for yourself. Like how would I in a very concise way describe this conflict? How would I describe my point of view on where it should go, right? Do some homework. Um, how do I want the conversation to go? How important is this person to me that I need to end up in a, in a solving the issue, but also in a better place with them when I'm done. Okay, uh, any questions? Because we're about to move to a new topic. Anything in the chat? I don't see any questions. Okay, let's keep moving then. So let's talk about stress. Okay, so a lot of you are stressed. So let's talk about it. Stress is the sense of pressure or tension we feel in our bodies and in our minds from the challenges of our life. It's never one thing. I'm gonna tell you my stress story. So I was having uh, a lot of stress at work and I um, was ignoring, um, I was feeling this like pain in my heart and I was ignoring it. I'm like, oh, I don't have time for this, right? Then one day I was sitting in a meeting 
I actually was facilitating the meeting and it literally felt like somebody had a hold of my heart in their hand and they were squeezing it and holding it and then letting it go and squeezing it. And I had to pause the meeting. <laughs> you know, I'm like, uh, let's take a break. Let's take a short break. And I bent over to one of my team that was there and I said, you're going to have to take over the meeting. I think I might be having a heart attack. I'm going to go to medical. <laughs> right. So they're like, what? I'm like, listen, I'll be fine. I, I think I'm having some kind of health crisis. I'm going to go to medical. So I went to medical. Luckily, we had a medical department. They put an EKG on me. They're like, oh, yeah, your EKG doesn't look good. And next thing I knew, I was in an ambulance going to the hospital. And um, it was a stress. It was a panic attack. It was not a heart attack. But I ended up in the hospital for 24 hours with a heart monitor and all kinds of stuff because I was ignoring my body. So I'm going to tell you, don't ignore your body. Your body will tell you. You can feel your blood pressure rising. You can feel stress happening in your body. Don't ignore it because it might not be a panic attack. It might be your heart. And for uh, especially for women, it's early and it's more silent. It's not traditional. Like you don't have necessarily that tingling down your arm. We have different symptoms. So learn about them and uh, watch out for it. So what is stress management? Since we can't avoid stress, we have to learn to cope with it. And he healthy stress management is being aware of your stressors and how they affect you. So for me, it was like in my core, I could start feeling my blood pressure, right? Um, and then know how it affects you. Some people get a headache. Some people uh, just feel anxious. They have incredible anxiety. Some people get angry right? It can be physical or mental, right? Take steps to reduce your stress when possible. And we're going to talk about ways to do that. Um, and whether that be in the moment or whether that be, you know, in your private life or when you're driving home or what have you, we'll talk about lots of ways to do this. Um, uh, I can tell you that sometimes it can't wait and you need to give yourself a timeout, right? Like I did in that meeting. Uh, sometimes it can wait and you could say, okay, I'm just going to do something to get myself back in tune so I could still be my best self and go through the rest of this meeting or what have you. You have to find healthy ways to cope with and recover from stress. So sometimes uh, stress is um, tragic, you know, losing my husband at 55 was tragic, right? And so I had to give my body time to, and my mind time to, um, um, recover from that and help my kids recover from that. And so I didn't work for an entire year. Uh, I, I needed that time. And, you know, I can tell you, I did not feel guilty about it. That's why you have life insurance. Uh, you know, I, I lived off of life insurance for that year. And um, I'm a better person because of that, because I gave myself time. I went to, uh, I've been to um, uh, grief counseling um, with other people. And I have found people in those groups who are eight years into their grief and just haven't dealt with it. And um, I, I, I feel like I, I really spent the time to deal with it. It never goes away, you learn to manage it. But you have to find healthy ways to both cope and recover, okay? So move to the next one. So I'm gonna give you another analogy. Imagine you're a balloon, okay? And each stress in your life blows air into your balloon. So at first it feels great, you're growing, right? I'm growing, I'm growing, I'm growing. But then at some point, either it's coming too fast or too often, or it's stronger, and you begin to feel the edges of your balloon, you feel stressed, you begin to feel uncomfortable. Um, and when stress piles up, you have two options. Option one, let some air out of your balloon, right? Right? bring the tension down, bring that stress down, do something that relieves that stress. We're going to talk about how you deal with it. Option two, make yourself bigger, become more resilient, right? Stretch the edges of your balloon. Um, uh, with heart patients, what do they do? They give you a stress test, right? Sometimes at first I thought that's the craziest thing I ever heard. They're going to make you, and they think you have a heart problem, they're going to make you run on a treadmill. Right? That sounds crazy, but what are they doing? They're stretching your um, sides, your sides, right? So stress does this to you. 
you are that balloon. And every day we live inside this body and more stresses are handed to us. And whether it be the drive into work or what's happening in your personal life or your job, those stresses are happening every day, right? Or, or COVID, let's talk about the big ones that we share. COVID, Sandy, right? I, we've, we have gone through some stuff in New Jersey. So, you know, all of those add to either your, the size of your balloon, it may have stretched your resilience. I think COVID absolutely stressed, stressed a lot of people. It also stretched a lot of people and maybe we're more resilient because of it. Let's move to the next one. And so what can you do? How do you get, how do you get um, more mindful and more resilient? Well, there's lots of practices and we'll talk about them, but you have to add behaviors to your life that help you to de-stress. So um, I'll give you an example of each. Mentally, you need some practices, right? So um, here's two. One is I have this little book. I actually bought this for in, in our town for all fourth graders. It's called the five minute journal. And what you do with it is, um, you start your day, you do your first two at the start, your first three sections, at the, it's a five minute journal. Five minutes at the beginning of the day, five minutes at the end of the day. The first five minutes is three things I'm grateful for. So I start my day in positive. Three mini goals I have for making today great, right? And my affirmation for the day. So I find myself a little affirmation. At the end of the day, I reflect on the day. And so I do three awesome things that happened today. How could, I, how could I have made my day better? What am I looking forward to tomorrow? So journaling is a mental practice. A second one is uh, when my son was 15, he was having some problems. We took him to a counselor. And <laughs> most of his problems on the outside were with my husband. And the counselor comes out of the room after the first 45 minutes, he goes, mom, I need to talk to you. I'm like, me, I thought you were gonna talk to him, right? <laughs> So I went in and he said to me, uh, you work too much. You're working 70 hours a week. And your son, your 15 year old said to me, even when you come home, you are distracted. And so I needed a new practice. And so I started looking, listening to books on tape. I've probably now listened to hundreds of books on tape, but those books on tape made me stop thinking about work and they got me into a book. They were all you know, mysteries or, uh, you know, I like police drama, you know, that kind of stuff that really captures you. And it broke me from my day. And so I walked into the house present. Okay, so those are two examples of mental practices. And there are many, many of them. Physical practices. So whether it's exercise or Zumba or, uh, you know, um, taking breaths, physical, physically, or meditation, physically finding ways to help yourself. Uh, in, in corporate life, I probably, I started my days at the office by uh, seven. My first meeting started at, at 7.30. So I had a half hour to prep. And then uh, they ended about six o'clock and I probably had a half hour then to like start working, doing the actions or delegating what came out of those meetings. In between those meetings, I had to have a lot of practices. Sometimes the meeting was so stressful that on the way to the next meeting, I would go in the bathroom and do 50 jumping jacks in the mirror. People thought I was nuts, but I had to clear my head. I had to do something to release the stress from my body. So finding physical ways to release your stress is important. Spiritual. So I don't know how or why I used to love to travel after my husband passed and it really hit me that my kids only have one parent. Uh, traveling, especially plane travel started to really uh, give me anxiety. So I have a practice now and I've gotten it under control. I am a, uh, a Catholic and I say uh, a decade of the rosary and I play, pray on the way up and on the way down and I pray for the pilots, the um, uh, stewardess, you know, the, the, the wait staff, the people who are helping us on the plane. I pray for all the passengers on the plane. I pray for me to land safely, you know, et cetera. So spiritual practices, um, again, you know, Buddhists have a lot of great spiritual practices that get them 
in a very calm state. Whatever that is, that's a, that is also a thing to rely on. And finally, relationships, right? Relationals. So um, <laughs> I know uh, I have a, um, a family member and when he started his new role, he had a lot of stress and, um, and he had a poor performer on his team. And if it wasn't for a colleague who he laughed with every single day, every day, um, and uh, if it wasn't for that colleague, he wouldn't get through, right? So maybe for you, it's going to lunch with a friend. Maybe it's a five minute phone call with your favorite person in the world, your mother, your kid, your husband, your significant other, uh, best friend, whatever it is, relationships also help us to de-stress help us to become more resilient, okay? So that's really mindfulness. I would say to you, when you get this, print this and start making habits for yourself. Mental habits, physical habits, spiritual habits, relational habits that help you through the anxieties and the stresses of life. And they could be tiny, like 20 jumping jacks, a Hail Mary, <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, listening to a book on tape for the 15 minute journey home, or they could be big, like, you know, exercising and going to the gym and, you know, um, having lunch or what have you, making sure you eat lunch. Uh, I know a lot of you probably don't even eat lunch. So making sure you eat lunch and feed your body. So we're going to try two practices. And I know, um, why don't we do the next um, question? Question four. And then we're going to do two mindful practices. So this is a two part question for folks. The first one is, it is my experience that since the pandemic began, and you answer that one. And then at the bottom is, it is my experience that since the pandemic began and you answer that one. So one is about the system you live in and one or the what you do for a living. And the other one is about the people you serve. Okay, so for the most of you, the need has increased. And you wanna move it up so we can see the second question. I think you have to, or maybe I need to do that myself. Yep, okay. Um, and this is a split. So, but only 16% say that people are the same. For the most part, people have gotten less patient and more combative. So that's tough. That's really tough. I mean, every industry, every human was affected by the pandemic. So that's really tough. So while you have that stress in your head, we're gonna do an exercise, a very quick exercise. So move to the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to just sit back in your chair and close your eyes for a moment. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to read, I'm gonna to read to you. This, you. this exercise you can do literally anywhere. I love to do this exercise when I'm in the parking lot going to a new client or walking into a client or on my way into the house after a hard day. It's called three breaths. So close your eyes and I want you to take a deep breath. A deep breath means you breathe in for at least a count of four. I want you to hold it for a count of four, and then I want you to release it for a count of four. So ready, everybody? In, hold, 
out. And that first breath is a centering breath. I want you to think about centering yourself, being present in the moment and feeling your breath. That's your first breath, center me. We're gonna take a second breath and this breath is a breath of possibility. So breathe in the me I want to be with power and purpose. So again, a breath in, hold that breath out. And now we're gonna breathe the third breath. It's a discovery breath. Breathe in the mystery, let go of judgment and walk into that next thing that you're doing. So take your third breath of discovery. So practice it. We will send this to you. Hopefully you all feel like just a little calmer and a little more excited about the day. Um, these are three, this is a very easy, it is both physical and mental to do this exercise. Physical, because I'm focusing on my breath and mental because I'm being very intentional that the first breath is centering, the second breath is possibilities, and the third breath is discovery. Okay, so that is an exercise. Everybody can do this one. It's very simple. You can move to the next slide. Okay, so uh, I met this lady when I was early in my career. Her name was, uh, I loved her name. Her name was Betty Gualfetti. And she was my uh, boss's secretary. Uh, so she also helped me out. And she told me that you cannot, you cannot pour water for anyone unless you fill your own pitcher regularly, right? At some point you're gonna run out of water. So you have to be willing to self-care and fill your own pitcher. And what does that look like? In the, in the simplest form, self-care is about taking care of oneself. I mean, really taking care of oneself. And that could look different for any of you, right? Mindfulness, getting a manicure or massage, gratitude journaling that we talked about, shopping therapy. I know lots of people who like shopping therapy, exercise, TV, mindless TV, walking on a beach, whatever it is that makes you able to recharge and to release stress, that's what you should be doing. And you should be doing that on a regular basis, whatever that might be, okay? So these are just some examples. Go to the next slide. And how are we doing on time? Do we have time for uh, a five minute exercise? If not, we the webinar can... is supposed to conclude at 1130. Um, so that's up, up to you all. Okay, well, let me just tell you what this looks like. And then we're going to send this page to a mindfulness practice. What is this? This is, and you can find these on apps. If you have an app like Calm or meditation or what have you, it's just a guided practice. And what it asks you to do is I'm going to read through it. We won't do it because of time. There are six steps. Find a relaxing, comfortable position. You could be seated. You could be on the floor. Keep your back upright, but not too tight. Hands rest it wherever they're com comfortable in your lap, you know, on a table in front of you. And your tongue should be like on the roof of your mouth. You should just be relaxed. Okay. And then notice and relax your body. So how do you do this? You just sit there quietly and you begin to think about where am I holding the stress in my body? Oh, it's in my leg. Flex it and release it. Let it go. It's in my knee. Flex it and release it. So just take care of that stress over the first couple of minutes to relax and to become curious about your body. Feel your body sitting on whatever it's sitting on. Feel the connection between your butt and your seat or your cushion that you're sitting on. And now, once you get in a relaxed position, tune into your breath. So begin that natural flow of air. Doesn't have to be too deep. It's just in and out. It could be coming, notice where it's coming from. Is it coming from your chest? Is it coming from your abdomen? Just kind of tune into your breath. Nothing, there's nothing wrong with the way you're breathing. Just listen for it. 
maybe in your chest, could be coming out of your mouth, could be coming out of your nose. But just begin to feel that sensation of your breath, one breath at a time. And when the breath is done, begin your next breath. Um, your mind is gonna wander when you're doing this. So be kind to your wandering mind. Now, as you do this, you might notice that your mind starts to wander. You may think about other things. You may think about what you need to buy tonight or, or shopping or one of your kids or what have you. It's not a problem. Just gently bring your mind back to your breathing. Okay, so let it go wherever it goes, but then gently bring it back to your breathing. Okay, and try to stay at this for five to seven minutes. Notice your breath in silence. From time to time, you'll get lost in thought, but bring it back to your breath. Check in with yourself at the end. Again, notice your whole body. Do you feel relaxed? Are you feeling, are there, is there tension in your body, et cetera? And then let yourself relax even more deeply and take those last few um, breaths and be appreciative that you did the practice today. That's what, that's what guided meditation is. It's just taking you through a process of physically relaxing your body, letting go of things, noticing your breathing, letting your mind wander, bringing it back. And if you do it um, daily, even for just five to seven minutes, they say your stress levels, they have tied so many physical uh, benefits to this. Um, so I encourage you to try it. Um, two more very quick slides. Samantha, can you take us to the next slide? If you're feeling too stressed, so for those extremely stressed people, I want you to pay attention. Um, if you feel anxious, angry, sad, hopeless much of the time, if you can't fall asleep and stay asleep, if you're exhausted and you have aches and pains and feel sick, you probably need to get some help beyond yourself. And so what does that look like? Sometimes stress takes a toll over time, physical or mental well-being, and our best stress management strategies are just not working. And so we need to ask for help. So go to the last one. And here's, you know, the kinds of things that you can do. If you're worried that stress is impact, uh, the, the impact stress is having on your life, you can talk to a supportive friend or a family member. You can talk to a leader or a colleague that you trust at work. If your workplace has an employee wellness program, you can talk to a counselor or talk to your doctor. Stress is a killer. So my, I encourage you to begin today your practices, mental, physical, uh, spiritual, and emotional practices or, or relational practices that will help you to control the stress in your life um, and to be your best self in every encounter you have you know, during the day. Um, I thank you for your time. I think the last one just says thank you. I don't know if there's any questions and we do have a final poll um, so that you can all get your credits. So while you're thinking about questions, Lindsay, why don't we put the final poll up? Great, I'm gonna put the final poll up and while people um, put their questions into the Q&A if they have any, I'm just gonna invite Lakia from Rutgers to say a few ah, words now that she's absolutely. able to be on the call. Um, so fill out the poll and um, take a listen to Lakia for a moment. Thank you. Uh, my video won't start, Lindsay. Okay. You can start the video. Uh, okay, so it looks like, oh, there we go. There we go. Hello, everyone. Um, again, I am sorry that I couldn't get on earlier. Uh, we had a shutdown on our technology here today, so I apologize. And Mark, I thank you for filling in and, and um, acknowledging the graduates. Um, I want to, here at CGS, we want to thank the program instructors and education committee, which consists of Frank Piazze, Rick Fernandez, Mark Lexison, Eileen Conunto, and Kathy Schultz. Um, without these five individuals, um, the program would be super hard to run. And we thank them for their knowledge, skills, and expertise that they bring to the program, as well as what they share with the students as the students continue their uh, professional career path in affordable housing. 
we had a total of 33 students that finished the program um, this uh, year. And we want to say congratulations to you uh, for all your hard work and dedication to this field. As we know, it is a big need. Uh, Jane's presentation was absolutely amazing. Um, I'm not particularly tied to affordable housing, but it was very useful. So I, I hope that you all take that with you as you continue to grow in this field. Um, and lastly, I want to thank um, Affordable Housing of Professionals of New Jersey for your partnership and um, making sure that we work together to help these students finish with their AHP certification, as well as continue on education credits. Thank that you, is Lydia. all. So congratulations, everyone. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me um, with any questions about your certifications and things like that. So congratulations. Okay, so it looks like at least you learned something. So I appreciate that. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions, uh, Lindsay, or um, not, but it um, looks like the, the the questions, quote unquote, were just compliments. Oh, well, thank you for that. I really appreciate being with you guys today. Um, if there's any follow up questions, you can send them to Samantha and Samantha can get them to me. If you have any concluding words, Ed, you could go ahead now. OK, thank you very much. Um, I, I'd like to thank you, Jane, very much for your wonderful talk. I feel more relaxed and better about life right now. So thank you very much for sharing all of that advice with us. And believe me, our affordable housing professionals, and particularly the administrative agents who are on the first line, uh, need pep talks like you just gave and some good advice about how to handle their position. So thank you. And also all the Rutgers grads, congratulations, a big class, 30 plus, that's wonderful. And uh, we're glad that they uh, can take the class and Rutgers and affordable housing professionals will continue to offer those classes uh, next year. So this concludes our final webinar for 2022. Uh, we'll be back next year. If you're not a member of our group, we'd invite you to join. And on behalf of the affordable housing professionals, thanks for joining us today. Again, Jane, thanks. And uh, everybody have a good holiday. Bye-bye.